this is this is not my speech. Uh, this is these are my spontaneous remarks, and I just <laughs> want to keep them here in case I forget them, so that I can go to them in the in the course of it. I stand before you a humble practitioner of a very ancient and a very honorable art, part magic, part religion, part showbiz, and part carnival honky-tonk. I mean, of course, the musical theater. And uh, I've spent the la better part of the last 60 years writing for the musical theater, uh, writing scripts and uh, writing lyrics to songs. Of course, the musical theater, by definition, normally requires music. And s writing lyrics to songs normally requires music also. I mean, song lyrics are never written to be spoken and recited, but to be sung. But uh, we have no piano here, and I can't sing. So uh, it's unfortunate for me that I can't sing, but fortunate for you that I know that I can't sing. <laughs> so you won't be subjected to that. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, uh, what I plan to do is to talk a little bit about who I am, and what I do, and what I've learned in this journey. And uh, I'm going to ask you to help me by supplying in your heads. As Shakespeare says, grant me in your minds, uh, hear it in your head, you know. Uh, and I am asking you to do the same. So when I talk these lyrics, as I occasionally will do, I expect and hope for you to uh, hear beautiful melodies in your head and orchestrations with lots of strings and a good percussion section and uh, a wonderful clear downbeat button at the end so you'll know when to applaud. Uh, many and many a year ago in a, uh, a galaxy far away, <laughs> by which I mean the 20th century. Uh, you remember the 20th century. It began for all of us here in this country with a innocence and a kind of insulation from the world, and then darkened and darkened and grew darker yet, until finally, after World War II, it emerged in a burst of sunlight and optimism and confidence, which was almost immediately overshadowed by empire. One of my favorite poets of the 20th century was Carl Sandburg. And then a poem of his called The People, Yes. He wrote about empire, and I'm just going to quote for that before I get into my thing. He said, they say and they say, and in the strut of fool pride, they spit into the wind. They say and they say, and the juice of prejudice drips from it. We are the greatest nation, the greatest people, nothing like us ever was. They set out for empire, not knowing that men and nations can die of empire. Good stuff, huh? And then he says at the end of that poem, he says, in the darkness, with a great shovel of stars overhead, in the darkness, with a bundle of grief over the shoulders for keeps, the people march. Where to? What next? Where to? What next? So I've diverged a little from where I was going, but diverging is a good thing. Diverging, <laughs> if you're a writer, can be a wonderful thing. You think you're starting down a certain path going to that door down there, and you're going to go down this hallway, and you're going to go in that door, and you see a door over here, and you think, what's that door? And you see a little light behind you, you think, 
hey, that might be interesting. Let's go open that door. And maybe that door will have a kind of illumination that you, something you weren't expecting or seeking, but maybe something that reveals to you more than the path you originally were taking. But to go back to the 20th century, in the middle part of it, I was a, a drama student at the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. And I was there for six years. I got two degrees, undergraduate, graduate, both in the field of theater directing. Uh, but we, in the whole six years I was there, even though it was a good school, we never did a single musical, not once, not even Gilbert and Sullivan. They were considered too frivolous, too lightweight. Uh, but when I was in graduate school as a director, I got an opportunity to direct the annual college musical, not put on by the drama department and uh, put on by the student body. And it paid uh, a fee to direct, and so I jumped at the chance. And then I saw the students submitted various students uh, scripts or ideas or songs, and I thought, my god, this is terrible. I, said, I don't know anything about musicals, but I honestly feel I can do better than this. So I called a friend of mine, uh, an art student named Harvey Schmidt, who played the piano and did a little composing for the fun of it, you know. And I said, Harvey, you, you want to write a musical with me? We have to do it in a month, and they pay a little fee, and what's to lose? And he said, sure. So we did. And we did this musical, a college musical. And it was a phenomenal success. It was astonishing. So much a success that the people we, that knew us in college all feel that we've been going downhill ever since. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was in the, the big theater there at school, 1,200 seats, <clears throat> it ran a week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, oh, boy, that really pops out when I do. But uh, uh, a little phlegm goes a long way when you got a microphone. <laughs> and it's a lot, of, a lot of phlegm. And uh, anyway, uh, this, they sold out almost immediately. And then they sold out Standing Room, which is, as far as I know, was the first time for that school. And then they sold out the aisles so people could sit in the aisles. And then they opened the windows, and people would gather outside, like peasants, you know, like waiting at the window. And somebody up the front would tell the others what was happening. <laughs> and I thought, my God, this is interesting. This is, uh, you know, I, I loved the, the, the plays we would do, but this had a kind of hot quality, an immediate quality, which was resonated with me. And then later on, I began to realize that there are two kinds of theater, a kind of theater I liked a lot and the kind of theater I didn't like as much. And the kind of theater that I didn't like as much was what you might call the realistic theater, a theater of, uh, that was the most prevalent at that time. You know, a, a proscenium and a curtain, the curtain opens, you have what looks like a real room what looks like a real tree outside, and people who look like real people saying what sounds like real things that people say. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of dull. And also, I, part of me, I think, you know, who's fooling who? I know that's not a real room. I know that's not a real tree. That's papier mache. At that time, I would have said paper mache. But since I've been to <laughs> New York and lived on the Upper West Side, I know now that what you say is papier mâché. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, it didn't turn me on. The other kind of theater, which was the theater of the Greeks and Shakespeare and Thornton Wilder and later Bertolt Brecht, was a theater which admitted the theatric, that you were in a theater. And whatever creation was done began with that. And for me, if you tried to tell me if it was real, uh, I objected. I knew it wasn't real. If you admitted it, it was unreal, then I could believe in the reality. It was a paradox. And uh, I also realized that <clears throat> there were, here we go, close your ears. Uh, there were some four things that I really liked about this particular kind of presentational theater. 
One was it had uh, being not realistic. It had fluidity of form. It could go anywhere. It could go uh, not having heavy scenery and machinery to move. It could go to any locale you wanted. It could go in time, backwards, forwards. could stop in the middle of time as Thornton Wilder did so brilliantly in our town. He just stops the scene and says, stop. Well, let's go see how this got started. And he asks these people to go sit down who are playing that scene. And then you go back and find out where it came from. I loved that fluidity. The next thing was uh, linguistic magic. Not being literally realistic, it could have heightened language. Language that was, could convey the emotions and the scene but because of the beauty of the language, like music itself, could give an added resonance. Uh, Hamlet, when he's stabbed in a sword fight and dies, as he's dying, he says to his friend Horatio, he says, if ever thou didst love me, absent thee from felicity a while. Not make a big deal of it, just absent thee from felicity a while. Well, this is not the way people normally talk when they're stabbed in a sword fight. You know? <laughs> I mean, uh, people, when they're stabbed, they go, oh, oh, jeez, oh, 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 and then they die, you know? But um, with this other thing, you could take it into another level. There was a wonderful sketch called uh, Beyond the Fringe in the 60s, British company, brilliant, where they did the most brilliant send-up of Shakespeare that I've ever seen. And they did just such a, a moment where the two men are sword fighting and one of them is stabbed. And he says, ah, now is cold steel twixt gut and bladder interposed. <laughs> 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 uh, of course, people don't talk like that. But um, people, people don't talk in poetry. People feel poetry. Our lives, which are inchoate in expression, are rich in enormous colors and what I would call poetry, complexity, beauty, color. And one of the great things about going to the theater, if it's right, and it almost never is, you almost always get cheated when you go to the theater, but for those few times when it works, it's like something that can enter you and feed you and keep you going. But, uh, you know, there's a, in Henry V, uh, says the narrator, so called chorus, says to the people, says, Now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmurs and the pouring dark fill the wide vessel of the universe. See, that's magic, really. Um, another thing I liked about this uh, presentational form was the fact that being not realistic, you could have all these theatrical devices. You could have a narrator. You could have direct address to the audience. Which reminds me of a story. Now, if I'm going to diverge so much, we'll never get through here. But I'll, I'm, I think I want to tell this one little story. Uh, Jerry Orbach was a friend of mine. He was in the original company of the Fantastics, as was I. In fact, it started his career. And later on, he was in a, a revival of Annie Get Your Gun with Ethel Merman on Broadway. And he played one of those uh, roused about showbiz types. And the stage manager came to Jerry and he said, so Jerry, Miss Merman noticed that in a certain scene, excuse me, I start burping. That's why I stopped acting. I, could, <laughs> I couldn't find enough parts for burpers, you know. And, uh, but uh, he said that the stage manager said to Jerry, uh, uh, Miss Merman noticed you were doing a, a certain thing. And I said, she wants to know what it, does, what it is that you're doing. And Jerry said, I, I'm just reacting. And the stage manager says, okay, good, 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 fine. I'll go tell her that. <clears throat> and he did. He came back the next day and he said, I told Miss Merman what you said, and she said to tell you, cut it out. <laughs> she doesn't react in your scenes, and she doesn't want you <laughs> reacting in her scenes. 
And of course, what that seems weird, but if you ever saw Ethel Merman perform, and she was a great performer in what she did in musicals, the truth of the matter is she wasn't looking at or dealing with the other actors. She was playing with the audience. It was alive, and it was a wonderful thing when it happened. It's like, a, it's like you're part of it, like you're dancing together, you and this great star. So the last thing I liked about it so much about this form was the fact that it, it could be not being literally realistic, it could be super theatrical and schmaltzy. Uh, King Lear, when he goes mad, the whole universe erupts into thunder and lightning. It's bigger, it's in some ways like opera, but in English. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it's bigger than prose theater. So um, I realized then that in my lifetime, the one place where these things that I loved the most about the theater was most natural was in the musical theater. The direct address to the audience, like singing, you know, or the uh, colorful language, the less than realistic scenery, and uh, being able to move forward and backward in time and space more quickly. So I decided if I could have all of that and be surrounded by chorus girls in little tights and, <laughs> and bikinis and things, what the hell, I mean, this is the way to go. So I decided <laughs> to spend my life pursuing this art form, showbiz. And the other thing I discovered at college, the two main things that I discovered, the other main thing I discovered was my own fascination with the changing of the seasons. When in college I read in George Bernard Shaw's uh, preface to the play Androcles and the Lion, uh, his long study, you know, it's his prefaces and were often uh, longer and sometimes better than the plays. But uh, he talked about origins of religion, a new thought to me, growing up as a Southern Baptist in West Texas, <laughs> origins of religion, there was like, you know, you, you didn't go to that, you didn't go there, you know. I mean, Southern Baptists, is, they don't believe in fornication because they're afraid it may lead to dancing. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Anyway, and that, that he, Bernard Shaw talked about John Barleycorn, the concept of cutting down the grain, killing the grain so that the grain will live, killing the God so that the God will live and be reborn. And this just blew my mind. And then that led me to Fraser and the Golden Bough and the comparative religions of the world, and that led me eventually to Joseph Campbell and the power of myth. And I'm happy, honored to say that Joseph Campbell was a fan of the Fantastics. I can't imagine anything that would make me more proud than that. So these two things were what I carried ultimately, the main things I carried from college. And when we got to New York, Harvey and I still riding together, still hearing the echoes of that applause. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> we decided to write this musical. <clears throat> the first show we did is called The Fantastics, and it's a, based on a Rostan play, and it's a, basically a simple a romantic comedy with a little twist. But we decided to put with it, underneath it, these two concepts. One was the presentational thing. We decided to make it totally non totally the opposite of Rodgers and Hammerstein, for example, whom I admired, but I didn't know how to do their thing, uh, and, and, and make, use every presentational theater device we could find. We have a, a simple wooden platform as the stage, boom. We have a, a cardboard moon held up to signify moonlight. We have a, a narrator who speaks directly to the audience. We based the characters on Commedia dell'arte archetypes and tried to give them a reality. 
we had, uh, I wrote almost the entire thing in verse, open verse sometimes, sometimes rhymed couplets, specifically studying Shakespeare, trying to end certain scenes with a rhyme couplet to give you a, a little upbeat to end the scene and so forth. And then uh, we even took from the Oriental theater the so-called invisible prop man, a person dressed in black. The audience agrees not to see him as he, for rain, soon it's going to rain, sprinkles blue and green confetti to signify rain. And for the end, he sprinkles white confetti to signify snow, or holds up a mask to somebody, or hangs the moon, or does the lead. And the audience, amazing as it is, the audience agrees not to see him. They just accept it. The audience knows. They know already. It's in their blood. These are ancient things. These are like, it's like watching a fire in the fireplace. You know, it's such a deep need that now they sell video cassettes of, <laughs> of fires in the fireplace, you know. But um, so, and the, the show became, it ran for 42 years and then closed for a few years and reopened. And now this new production, it's already run over 1,000 performances. It's had 22,000 pr productions in the United States, over 20. It's had productions in 68 different countries and many languages, all of which I have to believe is not just because it has beautiful music and a fun, charming, romantic story, but I have to believe that these other things that I'm talking about provide a kind of uh, basis for it that makes it connect so many places with so many people. So uh, now, I'm going to move forward. I, 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 in preparing for this speech, let me see, how am I doing? If I got any spontaneous remarks, I think I'm, mm -hmm, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I've, got most, I've got most of them. The ones I don't get out, I'll, I'll meet afterwards in the bar, and I'll do my, the rest of my spontaneous <laughs> remarks in there. And, uh, but uh, looking over our oeuvre, <laughs> that is to say the body of our work over these over 50 years, uh, it's good occasionally to look over your oeuvre, uh, as they say. But uh, I realize that uh, it covers many things, parents, children, love, young love, old love, middle love. But the thing that runs through the most frequently is time the drama inherent in the simple ticking of the clock. Now, some of these songs about time are, take the long view as, for example, about, about evolution. Now, this is a song I'm going to now verge forward and, oh, I didn't, you know, I forgot to tell, talk about the fantastic that much. Let me go back in just a minute to say how Try to Remember, which is the most successful song that we did, begins with that season thing I'm talking about. Try to remember the kind of September when life was slow and oh so mellow, grass was green and grain was yellow and so forth. That thing, and then it switches at the end to deep in December, our hearts should, uh, deep in December, our hearts should remember although you know the snow will follow. Deep in December, our hearts should remember without a hurt the heart is hollow, and so forth. And, and that seasonal thing runs throughout it, and at the very end, it becomes very explicit when the boy and girl are disillusioned and sit on either side of this wooden platform stage, and El Gallo, the narrator, stands center, forming a triptych, and pronounces a kind of an invocation at the end. He says, directly to the audience, he says, there is a curious paradox that no one can explain. Who understands the secret of the reaping of the grain? Who understands why spring is born out of winter's laboring pain? Or why we all must die a bit before we grow again? Those ideas that I talked about earlier. And then at the very, right after that, the boy and girl are reconciled. Boy says to the girl, he says, you've been hurt too, and she says, yes. They look up, and the mute standing above them, dressed in black, begins to sprinkle white confetti, and they say, 
It's beginning to snow. I know. Take my coat. No, both. There's room enough for both. O oh, sounds. O, oh, O, oh, O, oh, like the snow falling soft. And then the snow falls upon them, and it covers the ground. It wipes away the past, and it's a new beginning. It's a blessing, a benediction, and implies a new beginning, a new birth, a new life. Well, these, it, I mean, the audience never thinks a thing about this. Hopefully, they don't know this. But deep down inside, it connects with some kind of basic need inside us and some ancient history that's locked inside us and our needs and why we should be in the theater, going to the theater at all. Skipping on back to time, I forgot the whole thing, you know. I, but uh, I'm going to just try a, a couple of lyrics, then I'm going to scoot on down to the end here. But I'm going to see how this works. I'm going to try a couple of lyrics. The time, as I say, part of it is a long view like with evolution. Now I'm going to quote to you and see how this works. Now you have to imagine, you have to help me out now, imagine a little minuet-like kind of melody, sweet and like a, a little like a, a, a music box kind of sound. And a person selling postcards in the Museum of Natural History, postcards and other things in the gift shop. Won't you buy a little postal card depicting animals no longer here. We've a dandy little dinosaur you may assemble for a souvenir. Starting with a single cell, or if you feel you care for something more complex, won't you buy a little postal card depicting pictures of Tyrannus Rex? Once there were dinosaurs mightier than you, until those dinosaurs died of the flu. Won't you buy a little postal card depicting sources of the River Nile? We've a handy little kit equipped with an Egyptian crypt you may defile. <laughs> We've a freeze of Nefertiti's knees, or if you feel you're just a wee bit shy, won't you buy a little postal card depicting pictures of sarcophagi? Once there were deities up and down the Nile, until those deities went out of style. Won't you buy a little postal card depicting Indians at work and play? We have racks and racks of artifacts to bring back memories of yesterday. Silver pins and fancy moccasins that you may purchase for a modest fee. Won't you buy a little postal card depicting recent aborigine. Once there were Indians, now they are gone. We killed those Indians. Time marches on. So that's a long, rather dyspeptic view of evolution. <laughs> but looking at our songs about time, most of them, in fact, really turned out to be songs about aging and physical decay. Uh, and uh, there's a song, for example, I just do a few lines from it, from uh, when Colette in the 30s actually had a beauty shop and a line of cosmetic products. This is a song that in a show we wrote about her where she sings, uh, on rising with the lark at break of dawn, before you put your daily war paint on, disheveled and slipshod beneath the old facade, on looking in the mirror, do you whisper, oh my God. <laughs> when both those little dimples that you prize have turned to prunes before your very eyes, don't weaken and give in, just lift that withered chin. I've come with my emollients to make you young again. And she does a song of tango, decorate the human face. If your skin has sagged for years and years, you can tie it up behind your ears, and things <laughs> like that. But, and then there, uh, it's a diff, distaff side of that, and a uh, show we did called Celebration with an Older Man. Where did it go? Oh, oh, that fabulous parade of maidens that I made. 
Where did it pass? Ass, ass. <laughs> Those many scenes of tender splendor in the grass. Where did it fly? Ay, yay. Those endless one night stands, those ever ready glands. Where can it be? Yes, where can it be? Who could believe I'd live to see senility reach out for me? These are both long songs and so forth. But this is a process going along and writing. And following that, we did a show called The Bone Room, which was subtitled A Middle Age Musical About Male Menopause. And uh, in that, the uh, the central character is a middle-aged man who works for the Museum of Natural History gluing bones for the exhibit. So he's sitting in this little place surrounded by skeletons of all different species, including humans. And he, like going through this midlife crisis, goes into, in the course of it, a kind of, uh, with musical, short, in a, a kind of like explosion in his mind where he enters into a menage a trois with death and a beautiful young girl, death and the maiden. You know, it's not Hello, Dolly, <laughs> but, uh, but um, and I, the critics, hated that show. I mean, they, as if I were the Antichrist. I mean, they really, <laughs> really hated it a lot. And I don't blame them. I mean, it had brilliant things, but it, it, I, I didn't know how to finish it because I was living it at that time. I didn't know. <laughs> Where to go? But in that show, there's a this man, this middle-aged man, has a young assistant who's a real jerk, and who's always needling about age and about death. It reads the obituaries to him, and he does this song uh, to the old man about embalming. And I, uh, I just do a few lines, I, but I have to tell you, this song is in, in, in um, <laughs> it's offensive, is what I am trying to say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but as, as Al Goldstein, who at that time was the editor of Screw Magazine, was quoted as saying, nowadays it's not enough to be dirty. You've got to have bad taste too. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes of the 20th century. Uh, anyway, I'll just do a little bit. And the, the young man sings, no simple little coffin made of pine. No schlep them in a graveyard. No siree. Now when you're finished, you recline in an open vault for everyone to see. Now you've got to hear in your head the little salt shoe thing. Hmm? <laughs> I can see you lying there. Someone must have shampooed your hair. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful way to die? It ought to make you happy, all dolled up and looking cute, stuffed into your new Sunday suit. Isn't that a wonderful way to die? What perfection your complexion's glowing. <laughs> That mortician, some magician, <laughs> truly, you do look better, mouth all sewed up in a smile, face made up in the latest style. Isn't that a wonderful way to die? And of course, then it gets worse and worse after that. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Fancy casket. Made of brass, French provincial will kiss my ass. <laughs> and people weeping, fluids keeping you fresh. View that body, nothing shoddy. See how they covered up the sutures, and so forth and so on. Perfume powder by Chanel, so people won't notice that ugly smell, and so forth. It, it was a... Um, Yes, that was not a critical darling. And um, someday, I hope to, like go back and revisit it and maybe find the ending. Now, that, I'm going to move forward. You know, I don't want to take too much time, but there are like two more things I want to do. One is like talking about death. That was 1974 that was written. 
and I've seen a lot of death since then, and I've been part of a lot of life and a lot of death, and you, you perceive things differently. And in the most uh, recent thing that I've done, excuse me, which is a musical version based on the film Harold and Maud. At the end, Maud is dying, and Harold is, is totally her, her young friend, her young lover. He says, Maud, please don't die. And she says, I'm not afraid of dying, Harold. I've been afraid of not living, but I've never been afraid of dying. And then she sings, again, with a beautiful melody, which you'll have to imagine. We're like birds who are perched on the limbs of a tree. When the time is right, we simply fly away. Then other birds come and take our places, but they won't stay. We come, we go. It was always so, and so it will always be. We're like a flock of birds moving endlessly. But listen to me. I want you to know the most important thing. Before the time when we must fly away, we have the chance to sing. Don't miss the chance to sing. So uh, then one last little thing about Colette. Colette, I admire very much. Uh, Colette, the great French writer, was the only woman in France ever to be given a state funeral, after which she was refused burial in consecrated ground. Uh, <laughs> and she was uh, the ultimate country person, the ultimate city person. She was a, a journalist, a writer, a beauty shop operator. At one point, she danced nude on the music hall stage. She was uh, married and divorced and married yet again, in love with men and with women. And when she was very old, somebody said to her, they said, Madame Colette, if you could look back over your whole life and keep part of it and throw part of it away, what would you keep and what would you throw away? And she said, I'd keep it all. It's my property, my goods. And that single thing was what made me want to write about Colette. And what I learned from Colette, and what I learned, the sum perhaps of anything I've learned in musicals and in life, comes from that Colette and from a wonderful San Francisco writer, Alan Watts, in a wonderful book called The Wisdom of Insecurity. And it comes down to this. People want to feel good, but they don't want to feel bad. But it doesn't work like that. The ability to feel is the ability to feel. To the exact same degree that you feel good, you will also feel bad. And for many people, perhaps even for most people, that is so painful, the bad part, that they protect themselves by pulling in the feeling. You can't have just one or the other. You've got to either close off or open up. And what Colette chose to do was open up and embrace it all. And if she were in a musical, which in fact, ultimately, she was, at that point, she would sing, to know is joy. To feel is joy. To experience it all is joy. The good and the bad. The, good, the living and the dying. To hear each melody is joy. There is such wonder here on earth, such beauty and such pain. So many thoughts, so many songs, such images, such melodies and I want to sing them all. And I want to sing them all. All of them are joy. All of them are joy, joy, joy. Thank you. <laughs>